The first reading today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verses 1 through 16, and verse 105. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous ordinances, I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The second reading today comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 through chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have known sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound teaching. But having their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, be sober in everything. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The title of this worship series is Got Questions, Not Got Answers. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you showed up to this series thinking you were going to get answers to all the difficult questions that we have. I'm not that kind of a preacher. This is not that kind of a congregation, nor is this the, that kind of a denomination. We don't tell everyone what the answers are to all the questions. We think about those questions together. We wrestle with them together. Now, the United Methodist Church does believe things, in spite of conversations I've had to the contrary recently. The United Methodist Church does believe things. We have creeds. We have doctrines. We have the articles of religion, all the stuff in the Book of Discipline. The United Methodist Church does believe stuff. The difference is the United Methodist Church won't kick you out if you don't believe that stuff. Can I get an amen? Something. I mean, that's, a, that's like, that's good news, right? Like, we, what, it, what we mean when we say we're not a creedal church is that we do have the creeds and our denomination believes things, but we don't insist that everyone have the same answers to their questions. We don't kick people out if they don't believe exactly what the church says. So we're asking questions, knowing that this is a safe space to do so. To ask questions, to have doubts, to wonder why things are the way they are, and to express 
those wonderings. So for the next few weeks, we'll talk together and we'll pray together and we'll think together about some really big questions, all submitted by this congregation just a few months ago. We sorted them into categories and are going to spend now five weeks thinking about them. The first category of questions all centers around the Bible and the authority of Scripture. We had questions like, how can there be such vastly different interpretations of Scripture? We had questions like, how is it that two people read the same thing but come to different conclusions? Questions like, how do we discern what's a parable from what is a true story? Great questions. Lots of questions about this sacred book that we call the Bible. So this Bible, this book, is, can be safely said the most influential book ever created. Like in history, this book is a hundred million copies a year are still sold of the Holy Bible. It has been translated into literally hundreds of different languages. It appears in dozens of different versions. Uh, there, are, there are translations, versions that are word-for-word -word translations. So very scholarly, based in linguistic study and literary context. They look at the ancient words and they say, what did this word mean? Let's translate that word into a contemporary language. There are, there are also versions a little bit different that are not word-for-word -word translations, but also maybe we would say meaning for meaning or phrase for phrase, also scholarly based in study, linguistic uh, study to be sure, but also historical context. So if we read a phrase in the original language, maybe it's not word for word, but here's what that author really meant. So some versions are not word for word, but they're phrase for phrase. And yet again, there are some versions that are none of those things that we would call just paraphrases. They're not written for accuracy, they're written for poetry. They're written, written for readability, so they're really lovely, very easy to read. If you know the version called The Message, written by Eugene Peterson, it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase. It falls into this category of, of the Bible. This influential book that's all around the world and appears in all these versions and languages has inspired music and it has inspired painting, it has inspired movies and television shows and it inspires us as well. Our denomination is among Protestant denominations who have a certain version of Scripture, but there are differences in how our siblings in faith um, consider Scripture, very different from the Roman Catholic version of Scripture. And, and even uh, ancient texts, the Hebrew Bible, as we would call the Old Testament, is different for some people than it is for others, in particular uh, our siblings who are Jewish. And even among Judaism, there is diversity about what the Bible actually is. Is. It is a mysterious and wonderful book filled with lots of questions in it. But safely, we can say today that this book, this one book that appears in so many different ways, is the most influential book in the world and the primary source for our relationship with God. It was John Wesley who said, The scripture, therefore, of the Old and New Testament is a most solid and precious system of divine truth. Every part is worthy of God, and all together are one entire body, a fountain of heavenly wisdom, which all are who are able to taste prefer to the writings of any man, however wise, learned, or holy. Oh, John Wesley. So, this sacred book, this influential book that is the primary source of our relationship with God, let's take a minute to say what it is, what it is, what the Bible is. First thing to know about the Bible is that it's a collection of books. It's a library. It's got multiple books in it representing multiple genres. And that this collection of books was gathered together over thousands of years compiled together these, these primeval stories, right? Stories about history before written history. There are, there are histories in there, depictions of historical events. There are books of songs. There are books of poetry. There are books of prophecies. A prophet writes down all of their oracles that they want people to know about. There are visions describing the end of times. There are letters and letters and letters, so many letters. There are letters and uh, also just regular old stories. 
So this library contains all of these different books compiled together in what we call a canon, C-A-N-O-N. The canon of scripture, it's just the seminary word for collection. It just means the same thing, right? So the canon of scripture is this collection of sacred writings. And in these sacred writings, we have uh, this inspiration of the Holy Spirit throughout. So, so what happens, right, is that like something happens. There's an event. And it's a noteworthy event. So people talk about that event, they verbally describe that event. Did you hear about that event? Let's say, like, the event is like, oh, some dude named Goliath gets killed on the battlefield. Some really tall guy named Goliath got killed on a battlefield. It's the event. Did you hear about Goliath and the Philistines and da-da-da-da-da, like the kids sang about a little ago? Who, who was that? Yeah, it was great. It was a great story. And they talk about it. And this talk about this event can go on for years or even generations until someone says, you know, this is a pretty cool event. We should write it down. <laughs> So they write down a description of the event in their language that they know. And then they say, here's, the, here's my version of the event that happened. And then someone's like, that's great. More people will want to, to know this. We should make a copy of this page. So they put it on the copy machine and press the... Nope. They, they take a scroll and they watch and they write down... They copy what, you know, that... And you, you know when you're copying things, you never get anything wrong. And you never, it's always exactly what was on. So they make all these copies, right? So now there's all these copies of the thing. And then someone's like, this is great, but I can't read this language. We should have somebody translate this into the language I can read. Oh, I can do that. So they translate it. And once again, you know, when people translate things, it's always just perfectly accurate to what they, they, so they translate it and they, then they, they send it out so that it can be read and then you pick it up and you read the story about this tall guy named Goliath that got killed on a battlefield. And here's the thing, from the, from the event that happened to the people talking about it, to the person who wrote it down the first time, to the people who made their copies, to the ones who translate it, to the very moment that you pick it up and read it, all of that is inspired by God. All of that is breathed by the Holy Spirit. All of that, from the very event to the fact that you're picking up a version that you can understand to read the story, God is at work in and through all of that. We believe, says the United Methodist Book of Discipline, the Holy Bible reveals the Word of God. So far as it is necessary for our salvation, and then it goes on to say, it is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. Notice, reveals the Word of God. The Bible reveals the Word of God, not is the Word of God. Now, there's a distinction that's worth thinking about. The Bible reveals the Word of God, and that revelation is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit facilitates our understanding. So how is it that two people can read the same story and come to two different conclusions about it, if that's all inspired by the Holy Spirit? I mean, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit wants those two people to get together and talk about their differences and maybe the Holy Spirit wants those two people to learn how to listen to one another and to share together. And maybe the Holy Spirit has inspired those differences among us so that we will understand the only way we'll get the whole picture is if we share it together. Maybe, just maybe, the fact that we see things differently is actually inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because not a single one of us knows the Word of God. The Word of God, it's a theological term. The Greek word is logos. In essence, it just means the way God wants things to be. The manifestation of God's desires for creation, namely the salvation of the world. And the Bible taken as a whole reveals this to us, reveals the Word of God. In other words, it describes God's gracious relationship with creation. And humanity's loving response of service. So that's what the Bible is. Now, let's spend a minute talking about what the Bible is not. 
The first thing I want to say is that the Bible is not a storyline from Genesis to Revelation. Like, maybe it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's not just a book you can sit down and pick it up and read the story from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, some people have done that, and that's wonderful. Like, read the Bible cover to cover. That's great. You should know I have not, nor do I intend to ever do that. Like, I am not one who could just sit there and do that uh, because... That's not the way I'm wired, but also it really isn't written that way, right? It's not written as a story from, from beginning to end. It is a compilation from multiple sources. It's a compilation of writings from multiple sources. So multiple people wrote down their versions. If the thing that happened is a guy named Goliath got killed, you think only one person wrote down that story? As a matter of fact, no, in our Bible, there are two versions of the Goliath story. And in one of those versions, the guy who kills him's name is David. And in the other one, the guy who kills him's name is Elhanah. So VBS curriculum next year, we're going to have the story of Elhanah and Goliath and see how that goes over, right? <laughs> oh no, it was David who killed Goliath. Was it? Was it? According to this source, sure. Not according to the other. It starts at the very beginning, doesn't it? There are two versions of creation right in the thing. Chapter one is one, basically. Chapter two is the other. And some people try to mush them together. Why? They're just two different versions of the same event. Two different perspectives. When taken separately and together, you know, reading them together but not mushing them together, give us a fuller picture of the word of God. Right? It is a compilation of things from different sources. I mean, th the best example is we have four versions of the life of Jesus. It would seem like for followers of Jesus, if you were going to do one story where you kind of did it all together, that would be the one. But no, the brilliant decision was made way before us to just go ahead and keep all four versions in the canon, in the collection. And by the way, there are other versions of the story of the life of Jesus that didn't make the final cut that are actually pretty interesting to read. So, it is not a linear storyline from beginning to end. It's a compilation. The second thing, it's not, it's not a science textbook. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying that science and, the, and religion are incompatible by any means. But the Bible is not a science textbook. It, the Bible and a science textbook are trying to answer fundamentally different questions. That's all there is to it. Like a science question, uh, book is trying to answer how. How does this work? The Bible is trying to answer why. Why does this happen? The Bible is describing to us the why of creation, whereas, whereas the science book for, in general, is at telling us the how of, of creation. Some Christians would claim that the Bible is inerrant. The Bible can't make any mistakes. So when you do the math and you figure out that in the Bible, the earth is 6,000 years old, then by God, the earth is 6,000 years old. Never mind the fact that act, literal like carbon dating categorically proves that there's stuff around here older than 6,000 years. But right, when you have this sense that, that the Bible is a science textbook, you can't be a part of that reality. So something's got to go and you either throw away science or you throw away the Bible. You don't have to do that because they're asking two very different questions. The Bible is true, not in the sense that it conveys scientific data, the Bible is true in the sense that it conveys to us the truth of God's love for the world. Theological truth, different than scientific fact. And by the way, claiming that the Bible is not literal does not imply you think it's not true. Remember, Jesus d said, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little... I'm getting a little into this point, apparently. I feel my... Remember, y'all, Jesus said to his friends... He did not say, the Bible is true. He said, I am the truth. That's a three o'clock point. Like, it'll soak in, and at three o'clock this afternoon, you'll be like, oh, yeah, of course. Jesus did not say, this Bible contains lists of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. 
the incarnate presence of the Word of God, the physical embodied manifestation of the way God wants the world to be. I am the truth, said Jesus. Yes, the Bible is true, which you can claim with, with absolute confidence without needing to go into the literal scientific data there. The Bible is not a science textbook. Move on, preacher. Moving on. The third thing that the Bible is not, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, the Bible, friends, is not a weapon to wield against other people. In no way, shape, or form. Here's a pro tip. If, if you're in a conversation with someone and they say to you, the Bible clearly says, then what they're about to do is criticize you. Or someone else. You know, have you ever noticed, nobody says, the Bible clearly says, and then says something nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, always, it's always an attack after that. If that's the flag, right? If, if someone's going to say that. The Bible is not to be used this way. Second Timothy is, in fact, a favorite passage of people. All scripture is useful for reproof, correction, and, tr and training. And, and you'll say, well, I'm just trying to correct someone. The Bible should be used to correct someone. This is not about how we use the Bible towards others. This passage that Tom read just a bit ago is how we interact with the Bible ourselves. This passage is about, like, it's, the Bible's good for correcting me, getting myself in line. Your job, says 2 Timothy, is just to proclaim the message, to be persistent about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to announce the love of God. It is not your job to use the Bible to judge another person. In fact, Timothy says that that's God's job. God's job is to do this. The Bible is not a weapon to wield against another, nor a science textbook, nor a plot from beginning to end. So how do we read this thing? How do we, how do we read this text given all that it is. And the first thing I want to say about how to read the Bible is, is this. <laughs> this might ruffle a feather or two. I just want to say, you don't have to. <laughs> I know, I know. You're going to go home. Preacher said, I don't have to read the Bible, so I'm not going to. Well, fine. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, you don't. Listen, God loves you whether you read the Bible or not. The grace of God is there for you whether you read the Bible or not. You are saved by God's grace whether you read the Bible or not. You don't have to. You choose to. If you want to know who God is, if you want the word of God to be revealed in your life, you read the Bible if you want to be, as Timothy says, equipped for every good work, you read the Bible. If you want to do good stuff, you choose to read the Bible. You can read it as an act of devotion or a part of your prayer life or spiritual growth. You can read it as an intellectual study to learn, to discern the deeper meanings. You can read it as a parable or a guide for life or an ethical decision-making guide. You can read it if you choose to, but you don't have to. So let's say you choose to read it. What next? Yeah, I want to choose to read the Bible. I would say to you, read it with other people. Read it with other people. Paul said to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and know from whom you learned it. Not just what you learned, but also that you learned it from someone. And for Timothy, that was his mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. Because the Bible can be confusing and confounding and befuddling if you try to read it alone. Our denomination backs this up. Our tradition teaches we properly read scripture within the believing community. Informed by the tradition of that community. When you read with a group or read with a teacher, it allows each one's perspective to be shared. You choose to read it. You decide to read with a group. We also have three other tools. We have our tradition, that is the teachings of our church. We have our reason, that is our capacity to think. And we also have our experience, our encounter with the living presence of God in the world. Those four things, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience are known collectively as a Wesleyan quadrilateral. These are the tools we are given to discern God's presence in Scripture. Now, Scripture is the primary source. Scripture is number one. We affirm the primacy of Scripture, but it's not the only source. This is a distinctive of Methodist theology. We consider them, these other sources, to be, quote, I love this, 
creative vehicles of the Holy Spirit as they function within the church. Look, I know the Bible isn't an easy book to read. No one would ever make that claim. It's befuddling, it's confusing, and that's, and that's one of the reasons there are so many questions submitted last June about the Bible. It's, it's hard to read. Theologian and author Rachel Held Evans wrote this, when you stop trying to force the Bible to be something it's not, static, perspicacious, certain, absolute, then you are free to revel in what it is, living, breathing, confounding, surprising, and yes, perhaps even magic. So maybe we find it hard to read because we're trying to make it something it is not. Psalm 119 puts it out there for us. It lifts up the precepts, the statutes, the commandments of God, and it says, I delight in your word. I delight in your precepts. Do you talk about the Bible as something that delights you? Do you approach your Bible study class ready to be delighted by what you're about to experience? This collection of sacred texts, all inspired by the Spirit. This, this book that reveals to us the very Word of God. Can we approach it so open that we might be delighted by what we encounter there? It's not a history book. It's not a science book. It certainly isn't a weapon. It is, more than anything else, a love story. The story of God's love for this world that reveals who God is and who God wants us to be. And so I invite you, pick up your Bible, dust it off, (laughs) come to a class and be ready to be delighted by the love of God. Amen.